I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar with CMS Weedy and CAQH Core in the webinar series part two, CMS Compliance Review Program. My name is Samantha Holby and I'm the Director of Community and Education here at Weedy. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And before we get started, I wanna take a moment to go over just a few administrative details. As you have noticed upon joining the webinar, everyone has been placed on mute for the presentation. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. In your GoToMeeting control panel, you will see a questions box. Please type your questions or comments into the field and hit enter. Please note that the recording of this webinar, along with the slide deck, will be posted to the Weedy website following the live webinar, and downloading instructions will be emailed to all registrants. You can actually already go ahead and download the slide deck from the handouts portion in your GoToMeeting control panel. Without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Weedy CEO, Charles Steller. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Charles Steller. I'm president and CEO uh, at Weedy. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure for us to uh, co-host with CAQH Core and my colleague uh, April Todd is uh, with us today. Um, I wanted to um, uh, introduce a couple of our uh, main speakers um, and uh, Paul Anders. Well, first of all, let me uh, recognize uh, someone who's not speaking today, but nonetheless is behind putting, um, uh, working with us to, uh, and that's um, uh, Madhu Anadea. Uh, Madhu was instrumental in organizing uh, his team. Uh, his team that uh, are with us today include Paul Anderson. Uh, Paul is uh, uh, health insurance specialist at the CMS Division of National Standards uh, with Madhu. Uh, um, in, in addition to Paul, uh, we have Gladys Wheeler, who is the uh, lead health insurance specialist for compliance. Uh, we have uh, Janelle Herring, and um, uh, they will be talking further about um, uh, how to um, uh, do further outreach uh, on questions uh, and responses later on in the uh, slide deck. Um, uh, with that, um, I want to, we, we've changed the format a, a bit this time. It's more of a town hall. Uh, I think it's going to work well, and I want to thank you for um, uh, joining us this afternoon, and we look forward to providing some uh, useful uh, information and data on the uh, compliance, uh, the issue of compliance and enforcement. So with that, um, I turn it over to uh, Paul, please. Thank you, Charles. Uh, we are excited to begin round two of our CMS CAQH Weedy webinar. Uh, today's topic is gonna be on the compliance review program. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, next slide, please. So the Compliance Review Program was created to ensure compliance amongst covered entities with HIPAA administrative simplification rules for electronic health care transactions. The Compliance Review Program will conduct periodic reviews with randomly selected entities to assess compliance with HIPAA administrative simplification rules. Next slide, please. Under the program, HHS will review the following, transaction format, code set, and unique identifiers. Participants will attest the compliance with the operating rules. Next slide, please. Those found to be non-compliant or covered entities found to be non-compliant will be allowed to undertake corrective action. Covered entities who do not achieve compliance may be subjected to escalated enforcement action. Next slide, please. So the process. The process will begin with what we call a pre-compliance review. We'll triage, create, and assign records, mm -hmm. and also training. Then we'll progress to the compliance review package. We'll prepare, send, and receive artifacts onto the assessment. We'll prepare draft findings, report, or draft, uh, prepare a draft findings report, perform quality checks, and review covered entity responses. Once, we'll, once that's completed, we'll progress to corrective action. There will be a notice of corrective action. We will receive a CAP, which is a corrective action plan. Corrective Action Plan Review and Monitoring, 
certify and verify that the corrective action plan has been completed. And then we'll progress to the closeout section, which will result in a compliance review and a closure notice. Next slide, please. The optimization pilot program. In 2018, 10 organizations were selected to participate in the pilot program. Four, clearing, four clearing houses and one health plan completed the pilot. Participating organizations assisted HHS with optimizing the review process, including review tracking, coordinating and communicating with participating entities, and assessing violations. Next slide, please. The results. So as we look at these results, the violations that we encountered, 57% of those violations were transactions, 20% were code set, 19% were unique identifiers, and 4% operating rule violations. Next slide, please. So now will be the time that we'll transition into the town hall portion of the Q&A so we can begin that portion. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, this is a slide. Um, I'm uh, the lead here at CAQH Core and Explorations. And um, we're very happy to have a, a panel of CMS experts here to um, answer questions that we know folks have. Um, already we have received a, um, a volume of questions and I assume that, that more of them will come in during this call. Um, so given we have uh, an expert panel here um, from CMS would encourage people to please submit your questions related to compliance um, and we will try to answer as many of them as we can. Uh, if there are questions that um, we are not able to get to uh, during this session, we will follow up with CMS and provide um, some written responses uh, on our website following the call, um, along with the slides that, that Paul has just presented. So maybe let's, let's start off um, with a few easy questions for our panel that have, have come in um, to just start the day. Um, so, so first, uh, and this is one of the questions that we had um, gotten um, in advance of, um, of the session, is folks are asking for, um, for you all to define um, what a HIPAA-covered entity is. Um, I think most people understand the reference to health plans, providers, clearinghouses, but the question really is, you know, are there instances where um, a health plan, for example, is not um, subject to the requirements as a covered entity? Um, or are there um, exclusions for plans um, with fewer members or cer certain types of plans, um, mental health, behavioral health, for example? Are there any exclusions um, related to the definition of a HIPAA covered entity? Gladys, and um, what I'd like to say is, first of all, the HIPAA covered entities are health plans, clearing houses, and uh, providers that conduct electronic transactions. Also, on our administrative simplification website, we have a tool that actually is more or less a, a diagram that walks you through, am I a covered entity? So once an entity would go through that process, they could make a determination on their own whether or not they're really a covered entity. Regarding specifically the questions of health plans, what we regulate by is the enforcement regulation. And at 45 CFR 162.103, uh, health plans are defined. If you meet that definition of a health plan as defined in regulation, you are required to meet the HIPAA requirements. There aren't really any exceptions or exclusions for specific reasons. And if you meet that definition, then you're a health plan and you need to abide by the requirements. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the next question is around um, com general, a general compliance question around when HIPAA covered entities um, are required to, to implement um, new rules, new standards, new transactions. Um, so can you explain a little bit what the, the implementation time frame is um, from when a ruler transaction becomes effective to when um, HIPAA covered entities need to be compliant? Um, <laughs> excuse me, sure. Um, this is Janelle. So 
Um, we would clearly spell that out in the regulation. So I'll give you an example. For instance, if we were to um, move from a new version of the standard, the effective date of the standard would be the publication date of that uh, regulation as a final rule um, in the Federal Register. So for example, if we publish the regulation on December 20th of 2019, the effective date would be February 20th of 2020. The compliance date, if it's a new standard, is typically 24 months for um, large health plans and 36 months for smaller health plans. And I believe that providers and um, clearing houses would fall into that same realm, but we would clearly spell it out um, in the regulation if we felt that providers would need a little um, additional time other than a standard 24 and 36 months. Um, if it's for a modification to an existing standard, then our regulations provide that we give um, covered entities 180 days to be compliant. So using the same example, if we publish a regulation um, in the Federal Register on December 20th of 2019, the effective date of that uh, uh, modification would be February 20th of 2020. However, the compliance date would be 180 days from that date, which would put us in August of 2020. Hi, this is Gladys. Uh, while we're on that subject, I, I'd just like to add that, um, and I'm sure many of you, of you are aware of the fact that Nell spoke about modifications and new standards, but there is one other change that can be made uh, without that kind of time frame, and that would be maintenance to a standard. And maintenance and modification, new standards, all of those are defined in, in, our, reg, in our transactions and code sets regulation, but a maintenance change can be done um, relatively quickly compared to what a new standard or a modification would require. Thank you very much um, for that detailed answer. I think we've gotten a few different questions in around some of um, uh, some of the time frames, so that that's definitely one of the popular questions um, um, that we have gotten. Um, another question. This is about the uh, the pilot phase that you all have been um, conducting. Um, following the the pilot phase um, that you all have done, will you be conducting proactive compliance reviews or audits following the pilot phase, or, or what what is the plan for compliance reviews following what you learned in the pilot? Okay, hi, this is Gladys. Um, first of all, we did a, a pilot of uh, industry volunteers last year, and that pilot concluded in November of um, 20, 2018. The purpose of that was to introduce the uh, industry to the uh, audit program and to certainly for us to be able to find out any weaknesses that we might have in our standard operating procedures so it was used as a learning tool, but even though it was used as a learning tool, we did find violations and those violations were subject to corrective action by the volunteer entities. Okay, let me stop there because that's the pilot and that completed in November of 2017. April of 2019, we launched our compliance review program, which is the real deal. I mean, we're really doing compliance reviews. We're randomly selecting entities uh, that we are conducting audits on. As I speak, we're doing that now. Okay, next subject, back to another pilot. When we did the pilot in 2017, we included clearing houses and health plans. We did not include providers. Now, simultaneously with our ongoing compliance review, full scale, the real deal program, we're doing a separate compliance review pilot for volunteer providers that is already underway. And we're uh, actually doing the reviews on three volunteer providers. So I, I hope that answers your question. I hope it's not confusing. 
Oh, that, that's very that's very helpful. I think there were questions about is 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 the program active um, now or when does it become active? So knowing that it's that it's fully active as of as of um, April, I think being very clear about that is is very helpful. Um, so there's there's a group of questions here um, related to penalties that I want to ask you guys. We're, we're getting a fair number of those in as well. Um, the first question I, I think is a more general question. Maybe we can start with that. Um, what are the financial penalties um, for HIPAA covered entities that that don't meet the guidelines or, or are not compliant? And do they vary by um, health plan provider, clearinghouse, um, by the size of the organization? Can you talk a little bit about um, what the penalties are? Yes, this is Gladys. I can tell you a little bit about the penalties. First of all, there is a, um, a scale of penalties that are being assessed um, in the high-tech regulation, and I'll make sure we send out that link for you so you could look at that. That gives you some idea, and, and what is the way it's, the categories are broken down is whether an entity willfully knew they were non-compliant and, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, in terms of the dollar amount, but when we assess a penalty, we have not so far assess any money penalties in our complaint program or in our compliance review program. There have been no money penalties assessed. Our goal is to primarily collaborate with the industry and with entities that aren't compliant by way of corrective action. Now, let's just, let me back up a minute and say if, if we did, if we did determine that a penalty needed to be assessed, in other words, we were escalating enforcement and we were going to assess a penalty. Um, with our program, first of all, we have to look at what is the violation? Uh, how extensive is the violation? Is it for one transaction? Is it for one code set? Is it for multiple transactions or multiple code sets? Um, you know, it, the extent of it is how long has it been going on? Has this been going on for a year or months, or is this something that was just detected by our audit program? Whether or not any complaints have been filed for this violation in the past, there are, there are some of the considerations that we would take to, into a, a effect when we do an actual a penalty assessment. However, to this point, the violations that we have encountered um, have been corrected through corrective action plans. Now, let me just add to that in our current active compliance review program, because the program just launched in April, we're not far long enough into it through our assessment process to determine whether any of those entities are even going to be assessed money penalties or are eligible for it. But to this point, and I guess the main thing to stress with assessing money penalties is it really um, not only depends on the extent of the penalty and who is impacted by the penalty, but there's no cookie cutter uh, program for it. It'll be on a case by case basis when and if money penalties do get assessed. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to follow up a question um, um, on corrective action plans. Um, I think that ties in nicely to, to your most recent answer. Um, can you give us a, at a high level, um, what does a corrective action plan entail? Um, so what are, what are the components of it? If you could provide some examples, um, that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, well, when we impose a corrective action plan, first of all, it depends on what the violation is. It depends on the extent of fix that may be needed for the violation. Is there going to be a, a huge or a extensive amount of system changes? So we work closely with the entity that is in violation to determine, you know, exactly what the problem is, whether there are any mitigating circumstances that need to be factored in. What's it going to take to fix it, and how long is it going to take? Now, when an entity, when we're in agreement with the corrective action that the entity in violation is going to take, we require a corrective action plan. 
And what that corrective action plan it is not, it's an informal document because all violations are different, so there's no template for it. But what we require is that they provide to us um, really milestones that they are going to undertake in order to fix the violation, the time frame required for each of those milestones, and when those milestones will be totally completed and the entity will be in compliance. Now, while they're doing this, and it, that corrective action plan has to be approved by CMS. When we approve the corrective action plan and it starts, periodically, based on the milestones, and again, whatever the fixes may be, we follow up with that entity and, you know, to check progress. Where are you? Did you meet your milestones? Are you encountering any obstacles? Um, just to make sure that, you know, things are moving along and we are getting towards our goal, which is compliance. And uh, this is Janelle Herring. And one thing I'll add to that is um, as the uh, uh, entity meets the, it meets the different milestones, we also communicate with the uh, entity that filed the complaint to let them know the status of that progress. So it's a two-way conversation or three-way conversation, actually. So it's uh, CMS with the entity that the um, violation has been filed against, as well as the entity who filed the violation. So we try to keep all parties informed on the progress of that corrective action plan. Great. Thank you. Um, so a few other questions are, are coming in. Um, people are looking for, for a few examples, trying to get a sense of what, what is most typical. Um, so one of the first questions um, in this area is, um, can you give some examples of um, what would be a, um, a typical violation or the type of violation you maybe get most frequently? Um, and maybe if you can talk about that in terms of um, what would be most typical in terms of transactions, um, code sets, and unique IDs, um, I think that would be helpful given some of the questions coming in. Well, this, this is Gladys, and I know Janelle and, and Paul probably can pitch in here as well in terms of what some of the violations are we're seeing. But let me, let me just clarify now, we're talking about our compliance review program today. We're not far along enough in that program to be able to actually provide you know, information as to what some of those violations are because we're still doing our assessments of their, their, the transaction files that they submitted. But we can talk a little bit about the violations we see when complaints are filed. And I know some of the violations that, that I can refer to are um, mostly, well, not mostly because they're sort of evenly distributed in a lot of different areas, but we do see um, violations where health plans are not conducting the transactions. They're just not doing them. And um, our response, their response may be in some cases, well, no one's asked for them. Well, we are asking for them now. So, you know, we need to correct that issue and get help entities get into compliance. Another thing that we see is that um, entities are not following the operating rules and they're not doing the, the transactions in real time. So we do see some of that. Uh, that's usually related to the eligibility transaction. Um, we see a number of um, violations regarding the EFTERA where they're not submitted appropriately, they're not following the standards, they're, they're not being able to be reassociated, or in some cases, again, they're just not doing it. Um, I mean, that, that's just a, you know, an example. And as far as the codes that are concerned, we see a number of complaints where um, entities are requiring proprietary codes which don't exist except in their own their own entity their own organization so they've created codes to meet some of their very specific needs but at the same time those codes are not compliant so we do see that uh, i think gladys touched upon um the majority of my complaints uh, i i would say uh, the the uh, most recent complaints that i've received um, dealt with the 835 in terms of the EOB, 
not um, matching up with the um, change in EMM, ENM payments. And so the EOB doesn't reflect the uh, change in the dollar amount that the uh, provider would receive. So I've received a couple of complaints in recent days that speak to that. But I think Gladys um, uh, hit the mark in terms of the types of complaints that we've been receiving. I agree. This is Paul. I just wanted to, uh, reverting back to our last or our first uh, webinar in this series, 82% of the complaints we received were transaction based. Um, so, th so this next question, and I know um, Gladys, you had mentioned that that you guys are just getting into uh, the compliance program. Um, so, um, so I know you don't have a lot of experience with this yet, but I guess the, the question that's coming through is, um, what is a what is a typical time frame that CMS would expect um, for health plans or, or covered entities to be able to make adjustments and be compliant um, um, with different enforcement actions. That's one part of the question. The second part of the question is, um, you know, is, um, is this communicated at all to, um, for example, if it's resulting from a complaint, is the time frame com um, communicated to the complainant or to the provider if they happen to make a, a request um, or a complaint around a transaction? Yes, uh, in answer to the, this last question, we do communicate with the complainant along the way. And in some cases, and this is something that, that we see fairly often, is that when we get corrective action plans, we take the corrective action plan and review it with the complainant in, in reference to the complaint. Um, just to let them know that, you know, we have not approved it, we've just received this, we're in the process of reviewing it, and get feedback from them. Uh, the most chronic problem that I've seen with corrective action plans is that they take too long. And I know for a fact from my own experience, I approximation of how long some system fixes to take. But they, they do take a long time, and sometimes we'll, we won't approve it if it's taking an inordinate amount of time. And sometimes it, we will approve it, but we will ask for, and again, it depends on what the violation is, we will ask for an interim workaround on behalf of the complainant. So, I mean, there's some of the things that we, we look at um, in terms of our corrective action. Uh, and this is Janelle, and just to add to that, I, one of the things that we do is we look at the complaints that we're getting in and we look at themes or trends. And so based on that, we do uh, develop outreach materials that are, that are posted to our CMS website that could provide education to um, HIPAA-covered entities. And so um, it, it could assist them in becoming compliant if they're not, in fact, compliant as we speak. Um, so, we have another question um, coming in here around the pre-compliance review. Um, individuals are, are looking for some um, more information on what the requirements are for the pre-compliance review and, and what type of information CMS is looking to collect. For example, um, will there be a population of transactions that you're going to conduct in the review? Um, what should people expect in that, in that pre-compliance review? Um, hi, this is Gladys. Let's just start at the beginning where an entity is randomly selected for a compliance review. So the first thing that happens is the triage and the, the uh, preliminary steps in that we contact um, the entity. We let them know that uh, they have, in fact, been selected for the CMS compliance review and that there are a number of steps that are required. And we do a triage in that we want to know primarily information on a contact person who can work with us regarding this compliance review. And they may assign a, a CEO, they may assign an administrator, they may assign an IT, a CIO, or someone who really is in a position that we can do our regular communication with re regarding um, the steps in our audit. So 
So once we've gotten all that information, then we notify the entity officially that they have been selected for an audit. And we give them what we call a compliance review package. And in that package are all their instructions for the transaction files that we need to test, that we're going to be testing um, in order to complete the assessment. Uh, in contact information, we get information on um, their trading partners. We get information on the, their volume, whether they're large or small, and the number, you know, estimated numbers of the transactions that they conduct. So there's a questionnaire, and they have to attest because our uh, testing tool doesn't physically test or give us a pass-fail mark for operating rule compliance. So we have to, the entities give an attestation that they are in fact compliant with the operating rules and which operating rules they are or are not compliant with because we have the uh, ability to come back and request documentation to support that they are compliant with it. So. After they have all of that, and the entity gets the chance to review all of that information, and we will conduct a training program for the entity to make sure that they understand how they are to upload their files for testing and what any type of system requirements there are. So we give them a little, uh, I think it's about a half hour training uh, so that they're totally familiar with the system and totally familiar with what their requirements are. And once they've done that, then they have a certain period of time to meet those requirements, to submit all that documentation, submit their testing files and all of that to us. And then once we have all that and we've approved it, then we begin our actual assessment of those files. Um, a follow-up question um, has come in on that, Gladys. Um, how much notice does an entity get if they are going to be um, chosen for a full audit? How much notice do they get? Well, it depends because certainly someone that we have triaged right away and we have all of the contact people and we know, you know, who's going to be responsible for communicating with us regarding the compliance review. Once they receive their packet, they've actually, all that triage is done, let's just say it's completed, and they've received their package, they have 30 days to get everything to us. Now, please understand that that's, in our policies that they have 30 days, but there are exceptions and sometimes entities um, for various reasons have requested an extension. So we review the amount of extension they've wanted and the reason for the extension and then we may, we may approve an extension. Okay. Great. Um, we have a few different questions coming in here related to um, fees being charged um, um, for conducting standard transactions from health plans. Um, the question is, um, are, are fees that are being charged um, part of your enforcement um, provisions or would you take enforcement action related to fees being charged for um, transactions? Um, okay, this is Gladys. First of all, if you're talking about the compliance review program where we are doing audits, we are not auditing whether or not fees are being charged to conduct those transactions. If you're talking about the complaint enforcement process, we have received complaints that uh, entities are being charged to conduct standard transactions. So that, that particular topic has been and still is in CMS investigation. So we're going to be, um, we should be, I can't give an exact time frame for it because it has taken a long time up till now, but we should be a, 
I, relatively soon, I would say publishing guidance on, you know, whether or not an entity can in fact charge fees and whether or not it's a violation. And it's been a very, very complicated, complex subject. And CMS has been doing extensive investigation on the subject. And the reason why it's very complicated is because there are a lot of different scenarios involved, who's actually charging for the transaction, what additional services may be included in those fees. So there's, there's just a lot of different complexities that have been involved with it that has taken us quite a while to uh, do what we feel is a, is a very thorough investigation. Okay. Um, there's another question somewhat along a similar line of thought, and this is related to um, EFT and virtual credit cards. Um, so there's two questions in here. One is, um, in your compliance review, are you looking for the use of EFT um, and virtual credit cards? Uh, that's the first question. And second is, um, is there any new guidance coming out um, related to the requirements from health plans for providers to use either virtual credit cards or um, EFT? The, it, the implication in one of these questions is that they are being the provider is being required to use a virtual credit card with with a high fee. Um, this is Gladys. Um, first of all, as far as the compliance review program is concerned, we're testing the transactions, sample transactions, although it's live data, we're testing those transactions for compliance with the adopted standards. We're not really testing to the detail of is an entity using a virtual credit card or has an entity been offered a virtual credit card. Let me just say that virtual credit cards, um, it's not, I mean, it's compliant to use virtual credit cards. They aren't prohibited from use. But I think the, the problem that arises is that some of the things that we've heard and some of the complaints that we've gotten is that providers are automatically being enrolled in virtual credit cards and they aren't being given the option to make a decision, well, we don't want the virtual credit card. Now, keep in mind, there are a lot of entities that the virtual credit card meets their business needs and they're very, very, you know, they're happy to have that as an option. But as some entities do not want the option, they don't want the fees attached with the virtual credit card. So, you know, we probably will publish additional clarifying guidance on that, but for now, we're saying that, you know, uh, in order to get, first of all, entities can not just automatically enroll providers in virtual credit cards. Providers need to have their options, and their options are EFT, ERA, virtual credit card, or paper check. And the provider decides what it is that they want. So, and if the provider enters into a contract, I mean, you know, we encourage providers to seek some additional information from their professional organizations in terms of interpreting some of the contractual relations, but they should not be automatically enrolled in virtual credit cards and be forced to use them. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, this next question is... Um, Folks are wanting to understand maybe the distribution of, or how how re, how um, reviews are initiated. So the question is, um, what's the distribution of re reviews um, anticipated to be created from complaints that have been filed versus um, those that are just randomly randomly selected? Can you guys talk a little bit about about how you approach that or are looking to approach that? Is the, the, it's strictly random selection. We're not going by previous complaints. The only time we would look at a, a previous, whether or not there was a previous complaint is if, in fact, we were assessing the violation and we were looking at possible escalated enforcement and trying to determine whether or not, um, you know, a money penalty should be assessed. We may look for history to see whether or not complaints were filed for this very same violation that we discovered, uh, that kind of thing. But in terms of actually selecting the entities, it's not based on 
prior complaints. We're not looking at that. We're strictly doing a, a random, I mean, it is random selection. Um, so the next question coming in is, is related to um, the audit. The question is whether um, the files that um, that you will audit or will test um, under the compliance program, if they are um, intended to be production files or test files. And the question here is, um, you know, do they need to be de-identified? So there, the question is, what kind of, of of data are you going to be looking at and auditing? Well, we're looking at uh, production files and we have security protocols in place. We've been tested for our secure, with our security system. We are compliant with CMS security requirements. So you do not have to be de-identified, but um, we are requesting production files covering a certain period of time and a certain number of files. So we're not just going to get one 837 file. We're going to look over a period of time. And again, this will somewhat be dependent on your volume because if you're, let's just say you're a clearinghouse and all you do is eligibility, that's the only transaction you do. So the files that we request in that case will probably be somewhat variable from what we may request from a health plan who's doing all of the transactions. Um, so there's another question that's come in um, related to escalated enforcement actions. Um, individuals looking for some clarity on a statement on slide eight. Um, there's a covered entity not a piece of compliance may be subject to escalated enforcement actions. They're asking for some examples of what types of things um, would be included in an escalated enforcement action. Well, right now, and this again, would refer to our complaint process and not the compliance review process, but um, because we're not far enough along in the compliance review process. But in the complaint process, what we would consider escalated enforcement would be, for instance, um, if someone is non-responsive, we sent them letters. Uh, and right now, our limit is, according to our policy, or we do three notifications. So we've notified them three times, and they're not responding. They're not providing any of the information that we've requested. That might be an instance where escalated enforcement would be considered. Another instance could be where an entity is on an approved corrective action plan, but they're not meeting any of their milestones. They're falling, they're falling months behind in, in any of the corrective action. They're just not getting there. Or something's gone awry and they're going to need to develop another corrective action plan. I mean, those kinds of things which clearly indicate a lack of responsiveness to the fact that it, it's compliance is a requirement. It is a law and you are required to do it. And, um, you know, they, they're just totally unresponsive, mainly. That's where we would really escalate enforcement. Okay. Um, but there's another question coming in, and I, I think this will be a, a quick um, response from you all. But uh, the question is, is whether both the inbound and the outbound transactions are included in the, in the compliance review? Or, well... If, well, let's just take an example. I'm not sure I understand that question, but it would be the um, the transactions that are actually being conducted by the entity. So, for instance, for the uh, provider, and providers aren't being in included in the compliance review program at this time. They're only doing the pilot. But if it was a claim, you know, it would be the uh, the provider, the outgoing, um, the incoming would be the 835 from the health plan. So we're not going to evaluate the provider on the outgoing and the incoming, if that's what you're asking me, which I'm not sure that's what you're asking me, but does that make sense? Same with the eligibility. Yes. You know, we're not going to, um, uh, if we're doing a compliance review on a health plan, we're going to look at their 271. That's helpful. That's helpful. Um, another question is um, on the random audits. 
um, that you're that you have started and you're and you're conducting. Um, what percentage or, or how many um, entities um, are you planning to to select to audit in, for example, an annual time frame? Well, annually, we're not setting we're not setting a set number as an annual amount. I know in, in, in the beginning when we started the program, we had a certain number that we were projecting that we would like to do within a year. But one thing we learned from our pilot experience is that's not really, it, it's not really accurately predictable to say, oh yeah, well, we're gonna do 500 audits in a year. Or I mean, that's an exaggeration, obviously, but I mean, the amount of time that some of them take and you know we have to account for delays and account for extended extension requests, those kinds of things. But I, the, it's going, it's a rolling, it's a rolling number because, for instance, the nine entities that we currently have in review, the five health plans and four clearinghouses, they're currently being reviewed. So they're all in various phases of the review process. Some of them have received corrective action notices. Some of them are in the middle of testing their transaction files. So they're all in different phases of the uh, review process. So the rolling will be number, num I mean, sequential, so that if we finish one compliance review program today, then we're gonna select another one. So it'll just keep going on and on continuous. So it's not like we're looking to do a certain number in a year. And some of them can be completed very quickly, particularly if there aren't any violations. And some of them are going to take a little bit longer. So it's really like a moving number. It's not going to be stable or stagnant to say, oh, well, we missed our target. We didn't do 500 last year. Okay. Um, there is, and this, this is a resource question that is coming in. Um, does CMS have available somewhere on its website, or um, can they send out um, to callers um, a checklist of things that um, that plan should make sure that they are compliant with, or things that would be covered in an audit? Good question. Um, I know that there is a compliance checklist for providers, there's one for clearing houses, and there's one for health plans, and all of those are on our website, and um, they're, they're somewhat dated. So our, um, our outreach team now, we do have checklists uh, in terms of what entities can expect in terms of the compliance review program, um, you know, particularly broken down by health plans and, and clearing houses, uh, uh, some of the things that they need to look for. Um, we also have, and, and Paul's probably going to show you this uh, later if he hasn't already. Information. We have a, a, a video, another another video. We showed you the one that we had for complaints. Now we have. We also have another video about the compliance review program. We're doing informational bulletins, um, but that and we're updating our listservs. Uh, we have an operating rules week so that we're going to be broadcasting things of, about operating rules. But I think you know, and and I think that these tools are very successful tools, they're great tools, all the information that we can provide for you. But the main reason we, you know, want to have these kinds of di dialogues is because we want to hear from you. We want you to tell us, you know, you're doing a lousy job because I didn't know any of that stuff that you told us today. Or, you know, just to give us feedback and tell us how we can do better. Do we need to do more? Um, town halls, do we need to do open doors, or, you know, how we can really make sure that you're well informed and you know what to expect, so that if you are selected for a compliance review, you don't have to feel like, oh, when did this start? What is this about? So, we really want to know, and we need to hear from you, because we published a lot of information, and a lot of that information may or may not be even seen or read, so we're not getting to you. We're not getting to the people that really need to have the information. You need to tell us. That's great. Um, I definitely think that if you guys do have some checklists 
for um, website addresses for for some of that. We can post that on our on our website. I think, um, uh, and, and I'm sure Weedy would as well. It's definitely something I think that could be helpful for folks, given some of the questions we're seeing. Um, yeah, we have we a few. Uh, yeah, we have a few uh, specific questions coming through. Um, on a couple of different transactions. So, so the first one is related to the 834. Um, the person asking the question is wondering how you are testing for compliance with the 834 um, when um, with, for health plans, um, given that many most employers are not considered HIPAA covered entities. Hi, this is Gladys, and, and in some case, and I, and I understand exactly what you're saying. And I think the biggest challenge we've seen thus far with the limited number of compliance reviews that we have are the entities that are actually doing the A34. So we haven't really tested that yet. I mean, I know it, it, we're, we're, test, we're actually testing all of the transactions, but we haven't seen any of that so far in the compliance review program. And it may be early on. We may may just not be seeing it yet. Okay. Um, there was another question around um, claim submission, and um, again, this this one may be may be pretty specific. But there's a, a question here around um, whether a um, an organization would be compliant. Um, if they were not able to in include specific diagnosis codes on a claim. Oh, I guess I, I'd have to ask, why aren't they able to include specific diagnosis? And the diagnosis that they aren't able to include are standards, are the standard ICD-10 diagnosis codes, and they're not able to include them. I guess, you know, that would be a violation, um, and we would need to know why. But it, that that gets a little bit tricky, and something that we would really probably need to investigate and look at because um, it, a lot of diagnosis codes are tied to reimbursement policies, and we have no authority over reimbursement policies at all. Uh, we only have authority over the HIPAA transaction. So an entity may or may not be using on the claim a specific diagnosis code that's being submitted, and it's a valid code, and the submitter feels that they're not accepting it or they're not doing um, ICD-10 diagnosis codes. I mean, we'd need to look at whether or not they're just not doing it, or is this a reimbursement policy where they don't reimburse that code for a certain procedure? I, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that would need to be investigated for that particular issue. But I mean, if they're not using compliant codes, then certainly that would be a, uh, an alleged violation until we further investigate it. Um, I think we have a couple of time for our, a couple more questions here. Um, we, def we definitely will have some that we won't get to today, and we'll make sure to follow up with you on those and, and get those out um, out to those on the call um, and up on our, our website as well. Um, the next question is um, related to if, if an organization is selected for a compliance review, um, is there a is there a window after that that review that they would be exempt from another review? Um, so I guess the question is how free, how frequently can the same organization come up for a review? A year. This is Gladys. So if you get selected, uh, you're free for a year, and then you go back in the pool and can be selected again. <laughs> I mean, you're not you're not exempt forever and ever because we all know systems change, the standards change, and there's always new things. Um, and we maybe have time for one more question here, and um, so this will be the, the last one. Um, there, and a few people have come in with this question: um, Is CMS considering publishing the names of organizations found to be non-compliant? Um, given other other parts of CMS, um, 
you know, publish the publish non the names of non compliant entities. This is Gladys. Right now, um, well, first of all, let me just say, as let me the last uh, webinar that Paul conducted, we gave you a preview of our revised complaint report. And we did get some feedback. We're hoping to get some more feedback and we'll go back to the table and revise them so that we can provide the information that you, the industry, is requesting with our complaint reports. Compliance review reports are a little bit different uh, in terms of the information will be different. And we're in the process now of developing some models of what we will, in fact, post for the compliance review program in terms of statistical reporting. Sorry, it's taken me a long time to get there, but right now there are no plans to post the names of entities. Um, we intend to post information about the violations, the kinds of violations, whether or not money penalties get assessed, uh, the, you know, the number of corrective action plans, and those kinds of statistics but we are not planning to post the names of the entities. Now, that could change. I mean, we're not locked into that, but right now we do not have plans to post the names. Thank you very much, uh, Gladys and, and Janelle and Paul for uh, taking um, all of these questions. Um, we definitely have more that we were, were not able to get to, but as you can see, this is a, a topic um, from this call and the last call of a lot of interest to people. There are a lot of questions. Um, so we will look forward to posting the resources that you had mentioned um, on the website. And uh, we also have a few slides here to wrap up um, the call today that will, that will provide some um, other resources to our callers. Yeah, so let's just take a quick look at these slides. Um, CMS was, um, provided this, these additional slides for us. But so as you can see here, there's a resource slide. And then afterwards, uh, there's a slide with the names of the CMS enforcement team um, for you to see. Um, for those of you who registered, and of course, those of you that are with us here today, we will send the slides and the recording to you in the next day or so. You can also access this information on the WIDI website, as well as the CAQH core website including the first part of the series. So if you missed the first one, you can um, watch and see those resources on the website. Um, in addition, as April mentioned, we will follow up with the questions that we could not get to today. We will get those answers to you um, in the next few weeks. Um, and thank you so much to our speakers and our attendees for sharing this afternoon with us. Have a good day. Okay, thanks. Thank